Okay, so the book of Revelation, just for everybody that's not familiar, is the last book, <clears throat> excuse me all, is the la very last book in the Holy Bible. Okay, so to give a quick overview for everybody. The Bible, known as God's Word, is comprised of 66 books, right? There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is comprised of 39 books. The New Testament is comprised of uh, 27 books. Uh, most people, when they begin their uh, biblical or Bible studies, usually start with the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, some people start in the Old Testament with the book of Genesis. Um, when I first started or embarked upon my, uh, you know, biblical studies, I started in the New Testament. I started with the four Gospels, right? Uh, <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like I said, um, as far as I understand, they were of the 12 apostles, four of them is my understanding, right? And those Gospels are accounts of basically what they witnessed firsthand, firsthand, not thirdhand. You, you know, for those uh, people out there that may not be uh, believers or familiar with the scriptures, what you got to understand is, you know, you, 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 most people have heard of Jesus Christ, but you know, they may not under, fully understand that Christ truly was the Son of God, not just a man, not just a prophet. Okay, and the purpose behind the Gospels, you know, put yourself in their shoes two or 3,000 years ago, right? They didn't have technology, obviously, suffice to say, like we do today, right? There was no internet, there was no social media, there wasn't a smartphone with an app, right? So <clears throat> if, if, if you had been one of those four people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John back then, right? Uh, or Matthew, let's say, in particular, uh, or John, let's say, um, and you had basically hung out with Christ for two and a half, three years, something like that, basically day in and day out. And you saw what transpired before your eyes in terms of miracles and so forth. I'm, I'm sure most people would agree, if not all, that that would be an experience worth remembering, worth noting, worth recording, right? So how would you do it? So that's the best technology they had back then. <clears throat> right was literally the ability to just write it down and that's what they did and that's what the four gospels are according to mark luke <clears throat> matthew mark luke and john the other thing i'll say real quick is about the four gospels we know uh that they are true for a bunch of reasons because for over two thousand years various people through the millennium or centuries have tried to debunk the bible and in particular the Gospels, and they've, they've basically not been able to. Scholars, you name it, okay? The other interesting thing is if you look at things like, uh, into, uh, like uh, intelligence communities, uh, you look at po basic police work, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you're trying to uncover evidence or debunk something or corroborate something, right? I'm not an expert in this area, but in general, when you are corroborating information and stuff, um, there's a way you go about it, right? And usually it's like three, my understanding is three sources or more, right? Lee Strobel does a great job uh, uh, in his book called Case for Christ that I believe was written about 20 years ago. He was a non-believer at the time, an outright atheist. He said it up front. Uh, but it, but he, 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 his um, professional training was in law. And uh, <clears throat> I think he was a reporter too. And um, I think he did some work uh, with law enforcement and stuff like that. And uh, basically, he put those skills to use um, to try to debunk um, the Bible. And at the end of his, um, call it debunking, debunking venture, uh, he came to the conclusion that the Bible's the real deal. And that everything in there, and this was based on his professional training and, and his empirical approach to it, that <clears throat> it totally changed his mind. He went from over here to totally not believing to, you know, pulling a 180 uh, in which uh, his investigation, if you will, led him to believe that now this, this, this stuff is, is real. So 
I hope I didn't diatribe too, too much from what we wanted to do tonight. But uh, again, that, that's the overview of the Bible, 66 books, 39, 27, Old Testament, New Testament. The book of Revelation is the very last book in the Bible, right? It's the 66th book. And it was written by John, okay, uh, while he was on the island of uh, Patmos. Um, <clears throat> that's when it was written to him. I guess the, you know, the visions and stuff uh, came to him, uh, you know, through, I guess, the Holy Spirit. And he basically recorded this. The book of Revelation is broken down essentially into three basic parts. Um, what was, what is, and what shall be. Um, <clears throat> the first section is the present time. The second and third sections, or second section at large, was uh, uh, pr uh, present time. And then the third section was what was to come, or, or the future. Um, when you talk about the second section real quick, uh, he talks about things such as, again, giving you an overview uh, of the seven churches uh, at the time as well. There's a lot of, um, the book of Revelation is pretty heavy. It's something you need to read a few times. I think reading it through one time is not going to be enough because it's heavily written with symbolism. But all that symbolism uh, makes perfect sense once you get to study it enough and truly understand it. Um, so you need, to, you need to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would say to people that aren't familiar with the word is, uh, since it is the last book in the Bible, it also is um, prophetic, right? About one third of the Bible at large across all 66 books, plus or minus, is prophetic in nature, meaning it prophesizes what's going to happen in the future. And another reason, this is another way that I say to lay, lay, laymen or lay people that challenge it. It's like, okay, well, hmm, how do we know that the Bible is the real deal and that it's God's word and uh, stuff like that and it's all true? Well, about a third of it's prophesized. And up until this point, um, everything that's ever been prophesized in the Bible has occurred. It's occurred. So, you know, could a human being predict things here and there? Sure. Could man do that here and there? <clears throat> Probably, right? But could a human being predict? And I'm not a prophecy expert. There are prophecy experts. There's people that just specialize in that. I could throw names at you. Perry Stone is fantastic. Erwin uh, Baxter is another guy, etc. cetera, if, if you really want to go deep in those regards. But, uh, None of them have ever been uh, proven false because <laughs> everything that's ever been prophesied to date has happened. And so the book of Revelation, in, in a nutshell, tells you, is it, uh, you know, literally and figuratively, literally meaning it being the last book in the Bible and then figuratively and stuff like that, as well as literally what's going to happen, right, <clears throat> with the world. Um, some people that aren't prepared they're going to be afraid. <clears throat> Pardon me. They're really going to be afraid because um, they've not taken the time to uh, get right with God. They've not taken the time to start learning the word and to really work on themselves and to change their life because this is going to happen. This is, this is not a hoax. Um, and um, there's a lot of experts out there. I threw out a couple of names already that what they do is – they make the Bible as relevant as possible, and they link it to <clears throat> what's actually going on now in the world, right? The relevancy of it. And there are those that believe that the seven-year period is about to kick off very soon, either towards the end of this year or perhaps sometime next year. I don't know. But there will be a seven-year final period, okay? That period is broken up into basically... Uh, two parts. I may not get all of this right, but there's the first three and a half years, and then there's the uh, <clears throat> second three and a half years. Uh, in the first three and a half years, again, giving an overview of the book of Revelations, uh, seven-year period. In the first three and a half years, my understanding is 
that is refers to the tribulation. Okay, the first three and a half years. That's the tribulation period. What does that mean? That means there's going to be a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, famine, war, you name it, right? And we're starting to see some of this stuff take place already, right? Um, you're also going to see... Yeah, like 50 million unemployed. Yeah. You're also going to see the mark of the beast eventually, right? Uh, you're going to see a cashless society come and everything's going to become electronic for tracking purposes. And people are going to have to make a choice at a personal and individual level at some point, <clears throat> whether they're going to accept to take the mark of the beast or not. Now, exactly how that mark of the beast will come, uh, in what form, um, we're not totally sure yet, but, uh, but it is going to come and the Bible talks about it. Right. And, um, if you're a believer, you, you can't take it. I mean, the, the, the Bible, the words, God's word, the scriptures say, um, you know, to put it in layman terms, again, I'm not a pastor, but, or an expert on the Bible. I don't have 80,000 hours of study under my belt. There are people that do, by the way, literally 80,000 hours. I don't. Um, <clears throat> but I can tell you that in, in general terms, you can't take the mark of the beast or you'll be damned basically forever. That's not my opinion. You know, God is very clear. Okay. That, Dan. God's very clear. He basically says to paraphrase and I forget which part he says, you're either with me or not with me, or you're either for me or against me. You know, you're either on my side or on my team or you're not, there's no lukewarm. There's nothing in the middle. There's not, Oh, I'm going to, play both sides of the fence. I'll put my left foot here and my right foot here, <clears throat> do the hokey pokey, right? That <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> but people, Dan, but people need to understand that that, that, you can't, decision, you know. that decision may mean the end of your mortal life. Yes. 100%. Okay. It's not like no doubt about it. In prison like Julian Assange, they're going to, they could, I mean, you could starve to death. They might kill you right then and there. I don't want to sidetrack you, but I thought that was an important point to point out that it's not just it's not just a decision saying, "Oh, uh, no, I don't." No, want no, to. it's not. It's not to be taken lightly. It's a very heavy decision at a personal level, and the reality is nobody can make that decision for you except you yourself. Not your mother, not your father, not your brother, not your sister, not your sibling, whatever. It, it's you, okay? It's between you. And like and God, we were saying before, when we talked about it before, is you should be you should be preparing for that decision now. You should be thinking about it. You nailed it. You nailed it. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to accept uh, Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and believe that He's the Son of God, and that He died for your sins, and He was re resurrected. Yeah. Right. You, 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 that's the gift. That's the gift we've been given. Right? Because we don't deserve that gift. No human being deserves that gift because we're too sinful. Right? No human being, and the scriptures say that, is worthy of God. Right? None of us are. None of us could ever be good enough. The thing that makes me laugh is you hear some people say, well, I've lived a good life. I'm a good person, whatever. I, I deserve to get in or whatever. No, you don't. You don't because you could never be good enough. If, if it was just based on you Dave, or just me on, on, on our individual whatever and merits and stuff, <clears throat> you, you could never be good enough uh, uh, for, the, for the ultimate creator, uh, God Almighty himself, because he's sinless. You're not. I'm not. None of us have ever sin lived a sinless life. No human being has ever lived a sinless life ex except for Jesus Christ himself that was here as man briefly for, what, 32 years in the flesh, Right. I guess he proved it could be done, but uh, as far as I know, nobody before him or after him, you know, has ever it's been. Hard able to, to believe do it. that as a little boy he wasn't sinful. <laughs> I guess, yeah. I mean, yeah. Who knows any better when you're a little boy? Other than yeah, but here's the thing, though. Um, here's the thing, though. When he was as young as even eleven and twelve. He was being asked questions by the priests at the time, the Pharisees, I believe, the Sadducees, etc. And the amount of wisdom that he displayed at the time was, you know, 
neons, eons, whatever, beyond an 11 or 12 year old. He actually would perplex them and ask them questions back and stuff. Uh, supposedly the most learned men at the time. And they would be totally baffled and befuddled. They'd be like, how can this 11 year old snot nose know this information or how, how, how can he, you know, wrap us around the axle, right? Well, back then, education, education and reading, those were rare commodities. I mean, not everybody was educated or had access to education. So when you had the knowledge, they were like, and they, right. and they didn't teach you. They were, they were curious how you acquired it. Absolutely. And the reality is they knew uh, who he was the son of, right, <clears throat> where he was born and his modest means right? Son of, uh, what was it? Joseph, right? And uh, Carpenter and all that and right. born of very modest means, etc. right? It wasn't like he was born in a palace somewhere and, you know, with the things over his head all day and, and being fed fruit all day, yeah. right? With, there weren't with, a lot of books in his house. With, right, with gold bracelets on and everything else, pure gold, right? I mean, so uh, that in and of itself says a lot, right? <laughs> So these are the but most holy and learned men awesome. at the time. And yeah, they would just befuddled. Awesome revelations, but uh, I thought that was yeah. an important side note. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, you could call it a side note, but it's actually, in my mind, not a side note because... Um, uh, well, it's everything. Yeah, <clears throat> you have to be ready. If you reject it, then you're going to be damned. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, God's very clear. So imagine like, that you lived a Christian life... You, 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 your whole life or however long you've believed you're a good Christian, you follow the mm -hmm. God's word, and then you get to the ninth inning, and here comes the fastball, you know it's coming, and you strike out. You whiff. <laughs> well, I, I guess that's a way to look at it. I mean, uh, you know, the bar, I, I guess the analogy is the, the gift. No do -overs. I guess the gift is. Uh, God's pitch, right? He's giving you the pitch, but he's telling you, here's the gift. Here's the pitch. Here's what I'm throwing, Dave. How many of us are going to have the strength to tell somebody who has a gun in our mouth, yes, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, the, well, well I refuse to take the mark. I refuse <clears throat> to take that vaccine because I believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, so. And they're like, okay, my, then. You get no food, you get no water. You my, right, right. And my answer to that, though, is very simple. It's twofold. One is great point. And the second part of it is the bulk of people won't do it or won't be able to. We already know this. And the well, scriptures bas basically say this. The minority of people will do that. What percentage? I don't know. I mean, if I had to put it in human terms, probably one out of ten. One out of ten, what would would be able to actually go through with their convictions and be willing to to physically die for it? If I had to guess, one out of ten, maybe, or five out of a hundred, maybe. Maybe it's one out of a hundred. I don't know. I mean, the Bible doesn't assign a, a percentage per se, <clears throat> but it basically says that you know the boat. The bulk are not going to be, you know, you can interpret the bulk uh, as you will, but the bulk will not be, you know, saved. And in particular, uh, well, as the saying goes, everybody's got rapture. a point until you get punched in the face, right? So when you actually get to the point where you actually have somebody who's about to take your life for not doing what they command you to do, um, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to do the right thing. I, it, you know, and I'm not saying I'd like to think I'm brave enough, but 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 who knows? Um, but the point is, there there's plenty of examples in history of people that have, right? Well, so your daughter, right? And they have a knife in their throat, and they say, "You've got three seconds, pal." Then you're gonna make a decision right away. How many parents are actually gonna let their kid die in front of them? Really? Zero. Well, look, well, if the kid's already 
been saved and you and you're saved then in the scheme of things uh it, it won't matter because we're all going to die anyways someday now obviously most, most religions most churches don't don't teach this we don't want to exacerbate the process don't get me wrong we don't want to speed it up well see you know you just touched on a good point most churches for this matter christian churches even <clears throat> and this kind of disappoints me most pastors maybe they used to yesteryear but these days from what i know uh maybe i shouldn't say most but a lot at least my experience they don't even talk about the book of revelation they don't cover it and i have never had uh because it's heavy any priest talk yep. about that there you're you going to have to possibly make this choice well they need to they need to prepare their flock well especially now yes I mean, yes. Heating up this year. This is not an easy thing to do. I'll be the first to admit it. But if you're a pastor, you need to start preparing your flock. God expects that. That's not my opinion, Dan's opinion. Okay, if you know the word at all, okay, and I've read most of the Bible, not all of it. I still have to finish about 20% of it or whatever, 25%. But the, 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 what I have read, I've read the entire New Testament twice. Uh, I've read two thirds of the Old Testament, uh, and I'm trying to finish the last third. But my point is, as a layman, uh, what I do understand uh, of the word in general, and particularly as it relates to the book of Revelation, is uh, pastors need to be preparing their flock. Um, and the ones that aren't doing this, they're, uh, they're being delinquent, really. You know, if that's the right word, I can't think of another word, but. Yeah, um, one of them will probably <clears throat> tell the people to take the vaccine. Look. Where everybody's good. Well, see, here's the thing. Especially the last 50 years in America, 40 years, whatever, uh, a lot of churches uh, just kind of cover and teach, you know, the rah-rah, what feels good stuff, right? Don't rock the boat. Yeah. And Revelation rocks the boat. Okay, Revelation it is telling you the end game and how it's all going to go down. If you want to know how the history of the world is going to turn out and uh, what it's going to be like just before Christ comes back, as well as what it's going to be like after he comes back with his thousand-year reign, by the way, just after the rapture. And as part of that thousand-year reign, by the way, He's going to stop, you know, before that, he'll, he will have stopped the Antichrist. He will have stopped the false prophet, which will probably be the Pope at the time, in conjunction with the Antichrist. He will have stopped all that. Uh, the rapture, those that will go up in the clouds and meet with him uh, and be taken to heaven. Everybody that's left on earth, um, <laughs> for those that will be left on earth, and I'm not trying to be dogmatic or scare people. This is what the scriptures say. Um, it's going to be not a pleasant time. So you want to be raptured? I would think so. Because <laughs> if you're left behind, you're going to be in for a world of hurt. That's God what, saying what, that... What year in the seven does the rapture happen? <clears throat> what, within the seven years? Yeah, when does the rapture happen? Uh, 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 my understanding is, uh, I think it's uh, verse 13, uh, chapter 13, uh, verse 21 talks about that. So um, uh, I, I think what's going to happen is there'll be the Armageddon, the apocalypse, right? Um, basically, World War Three is going to happen, right? Uh, World War Three is going to occur, uh, basically, I think, just outside of, uh, in Israel, in the... Uh, Meganon or Megiddo, Megiddo Valley is where World War III ultimately uh, will start. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the raptured, they're all, they're all people who are alive when they're raptured? I believe so. I, I think so. Maybe, maybe actually, uh, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, definitely alive, and maybe uh, those that were worthy too, that were even dead, if they're in the graves what too. If were, what if you were cremated? 
uh, you still have a spirit, I guess, right? So, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. it used to be the church's policy not to get cremated. Yeah, right. Well, I guess technically your, yeah. your body's the shell that houses your spirit. So, you know, there's man again doing his thing, you know. Let's destroy the body. Let's cremate it, you know, save real estate. But, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we're spirits, right? If you well, believe, in, if you believe, I mean, if you believe in the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? That's why we have a thing, you know, in colloquial terms, we call it our, you know, guilt complex or whatever, our conscience, right? You know, when you do something bad or wrong, you feel bad about it. Most sane people, if they say or do something wrong or bad, they know deep down what they did was wrong, if you're sane. You know, if you're a psychopath, that's a different story, you know? Right. It's either at the beginning, and this is important for viewers, either at the beginning or the, at the very end of Book of Revelation, it basically says, I'm paraphrasing, um, essentially, don't ever change the words. Don't ever add to it or delete from these words, or you will be essentially damned. That's a so, powerful statement. Yes. God's saying, basically, look, guys, I love you and everything, but... This is my word. Yep. If you so, don't want to, if you don't want to believe it via the gift I've given you, that's fine. But do not change my word. Do not alter my word. Do not add to it. Do not delete it. Do not modify it. Do nothing. This is Revelation one. Okay, chapter one, verse one. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants <clears throat> what must soon come to pass. Now, keep in mind, guys, um, you know, we think in terms of time as human beings, a year, five years, 10 years, wow, that's a long time, 20 years, right? You know, God thinks, uh, and there's a part of the Bible that addresses this, I forget which part, but I listened to a pastor talk about it one time. But in a nutshell, um, you know, suffice to say, if you're talking about the creator of the universe, right? A hundred years to him is a blink. It's nothing. Even a thousand years is nothing. So when this was written like 2,000 years ago, you know, from God's perspective, 2,000 years later, which is now, that's, that's a pretty quick time. That's right. That's not a long time. Yeah, when they mentioned seven days in Genesis, it really wasn't seven days. Yeah, it was. Yeah. On the first day, God, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, which must soon come to pass. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. Remember when I talked about John on Patmos, who testifies to everything he saw. John, that is. This is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one, here we go. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear, who hear and obey what is written in it, because the time is near. John greets the seven churches. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, right? So at the time when John was alive, there were seven, I guess, main churches, right? And so uh, I guess God, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through Christ was addressing these and kind of downloading it to John, so to speak. Well, seven is a very important number in Revelation. It's a significant number in the Bible, right? All kidding aside, right? You know, book of Genesis, seven days, right? Seven churches, right? I guess 12 is another one. So, <clears throat> John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to him from him who is and was and is to come and from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Right? So um, when Christ comes back, this is alluding to it, but when Christ comes back in the second half of the seven-year period, uh, after the rapture, you know, he's going to be crowned. Rule the world for a thousand years. And during that thousand years, there will be total peace and bliss on earth. <clears throat> Man won't have his chance at that point to follow things up and create pestilence and war and everything else. Right. 
and those that'll be with Christ uh, will basically be, um, you know, teachers of the word and stuff like that. So, uh, behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. In all the tribes of the earth, meaning all the peoples, right, including the original 12 tribes, will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, meaning the beginning and the end, right? A to Z, whatever, says the Lord God. He is and he was and is to come, the Almighty. John's vision at Patmos, right? I already told you about the island of Patmos, right? John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and in my testimony about Jesus, right? And then he says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, right? So John was at, on Patmos, he's saying, and he was chilling out and he was praying, you know, meditating, praying, etc. And then he says, like I said to you earlier, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a scroll. Now the words here in red are to denote, this is Christ himself speaking. He said to John, Write in a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Peregrim, uh, to uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Sardis, that is Philadelphia and Laodicea. <clears throat> then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. This is John speaking. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was one like the son of man dressed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest the hair of his head was white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were like a blazing fire his feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters he held in his right hand the seven stars and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. His face was like the sun, shining at its brightest. Pretty powerful. So this is John saying, literally, this is what he saw. So, you know, there's only three possibilities here, folks. He's telling the truth, he's a liar, or he's insane. So, you know, basic statistics, right? Or he was on drugs. Was he lying here or insane? Maybe, but he wasn't known for that. He didn't have that reputation, so he was probably telling the truth. That's my conclusion, uh, not to mention he was one of the 12 that actually hung out with Christ for over two and a half years. So anyway, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, but he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, now I am alive forever and ever, right? In other words, he was uh, crucified, is what he's referring to. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades, right? So, um, you know, he says, I hold the keys of death and of Hades. So, like, when we all die, we're going to account for our lives, right? So, that's, you know, going to be part of it for all of us, right? Therefore, write down, then he says to John, point blank, right? You know, that's another thing I just want to say real quick. Everybody says, a lot of people say to me all the time, well, I don't read the Bible, it's not relevant. Oh, and oh, by the way, it's so difficult to understand. You know, it's such mumbo jumbo or so highly symbolic, I just don't know what it's saying. You know, I'm not a scholar, guys, but this is pretty straightforward to me. And I hope you agree, Dave. And for those watching, I hope you agree. We aren't, we aren't in the parts yet that are symbolic. Well, okay, we're going to get there. Don't worry. But but my point is, a lot of it's a lot of it's pretty straightforward. You know, straightforward. Among the there were seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so that's some symbolism. I'll give you that. But but here's the thing. Give it a little time, okay, because uh, we live in a microwave society. Those are going to be explained later on, and they'll be pretty clearly explained. Then he says, therefore, write down the things you have seen and the things that are and the things that will happen after this, right? This is the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. 
The seven, now, now he tells you right here, Dave, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So the seven stars represent each major church at the time. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay? Well, I just want to say this because it's what popped into my mind when, when we were talking before, is, you know, Hollywood and <clears throat> authors, you know, they really take a lot out of the Bible and turn it into their own stories. And one of the stories I'll bet you came from this was Ebenezer Scrooge and the, uh, I forget the name of that play, but um, what is the name of that? You know who I'm talking about, right? When I do. he's visited by the ghost of past. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it reminds me of. Therefore, write down the things you have seen, the things that are, and the things that will happen. I mean, that's the story of Ebenezer Scrooge and the ghost of past, the ghost of present, and the ghost of the future. There you go. There you go. So great point, Dave. Excellent point. Moral of the story is you see this in a pop culture, modern colloquial, whatever culture. You, you, you see stuff like this all the time, right? And like the saying goes, you and I have talked about this, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. You hear people say that all the time. And they, they don't even know where they heard it from. They heard their parents say it or a friend say it. But, they, but my point is everything has a true origin, everything. It's just a matter of you willing to take the time to trace it back, right? So, you know, everything under the sun. I mean, that comes from uh, uh, a, a book in the Bible. It'll take us a few sessions <clears throat> to get through the whole book, but it's worth it. It's, it, it's absolutely worth it because <clears throat> this is where everything is ultimately going, whether we see it in our lifetime or shortly thereafter. It, oh, by the way, if this does all go down in our lifetime, it's not necessarily, uh, I don't want to connote or imply in any way, shape, or form because we're somehow special or not. We're, we're not. Um, but what's amazing is that this stuff, the time it was written, um, you know, versus the current times we live in, there's been no other time in history, and I think most people would agree, that... <clears throat> This is almost perfect timing for like what's going on uh, in Revelation and you talk a mark of the beast. You know, when you corroborate current times with the current technology for that to even take place, it's basically now, right? It couldn't happen f even 20 years ago, definitely not 100 years ago, but we have the means and the technology now, right? For this it, stuff is it, is it, to happen. And this is what people need to understand. It's here now. The abilities for this stuff to go down is here now. Not even 10 years from now. Not 50 years from now. Maybe a year or two from now. Or maybe within five or less. But it's basically here. The technology is here for this stuff to be done. Right? Because, you know, look at the computing power. Look at Moore's Law at the rate of which things advance every year and a half now computing power, memory power, nano chip technology as well, right? I mean, they've got, they've got uh, you know, there's capacitors, resistors, outright little nano computers that you can't even see with the naked eye that they could easily pump into your bloodstream. Okay, this sounds like sci-fi, but the technology's here. It's here, and it can be done, right? And, and oh, by the way, uh, 5G is going to lead this way, folks. I know a lot of you know this, but I know a lot of you don't. A lot of people think, oh, yeah, 5G, I, I can't wait. I'm so psyched. You know, it's like 100 times or 1,000 times faster than 4G. And it's going to be able to do stuff that, uh, oh, by the way, most of you can't even conceive, including monitor you. Well, most 20... people don't even realize what the advent for 5G was. What the advent was? Well, what was it? What? For surveillance of pub the right. public. Surveillance in general, absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's why it was created. They realized they didn't have enough speed to surveil the public. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I wonder if I wonder if what you're saying is debatable. You know what I mean? Let's that's put it this way. Fact. That's a fact. That wasn't 
let's put it this way, it hasn't been sold that way. The corporations and stuff and the powers that be are not selling that it that way to the public. You know that, right? I'll just be Mr. Obvious, right? It's not being sold that way, right? It's being sold as, you know, yeah, just, that one can do it's going to make your life even better. Internet of everything. Everything will be on the net now, no matter what, right? Your toaster, right? You walk into your house, you say 72 degrees, boink, you know, coffee, boink, um, ex, you know, That's right. And that's, why, and that's why there are people who will gladly give up their freedoms for these technological advances. Because to them, I mean, you see in China right now, the Chinese willingly give up their rights or freedoms. Yeah. God bless them. Because Good for them. Because for security, which is what Ben Franklin warned about 250 years ago. Yeah, the founding fathers warned us of that, 100%. Yeah, I mean, look, the Constitution was written, uh, and particularly written the way it was, because they had firsthand experience on what it was like to be, you know, uh, uh, misused and abused and everything else, right? And do you, think, um, do you think the founding fathers, do you think that they actually believed in the Bible? My understanding was of the, what was it, 50 or 60 guys uh, uh, actually signed off on the Constitution across the, what was it, 13 states at the time? Colonies. Colonies at the time, right? Massachusetts had like, what, seven men that signed off on it, something like that. I have no idea. Yeah, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So Massachusetts had John Hancock, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, Elbridge Gerry, right? Just to give you an example. So those were the signers, signers of the unanimous declaration, according to the authenticated list printed by the Order of Congress, January 18th, 1777. So I take two books in particular, very seriously, I, and I have for the longest time. The Holy Bible, obviously, and then this baby right here. The Constitution of the U.S. There's never, besides the Holy Bible, uh, which is the Word of God, this is inspired by the Word of God, in my humble opinion. Now, is this perfect? Absolutely hold that, not. Hold that back up. It was written hold, by men. Hold that back up, please. How, th how thick is that? Turn it sideways. <laughs> not very thick at all. Yep. There it is, baby. But if you lean and mean, baby, no if, fat on this thing. <laughs> if you compare that book you have in your hand, no fat here. If you compare that book you have in your hands <laughs> to the federal tax code and all the laws we have on the book today, which is <laughs> this, thick, this thick and getting dude, longer every dude. year, holiday, every year forty thousand pages go into it. Amen. You and know, I look, feel safer. Hey, dude, you know, <clears throat> it's a joke. I mean, how, how thick is the Patriot Act? I don't know. Take the IRS code. Isn't, isn't that something like 85,000 forms? Some ungodly figure? Really? But here's the thing with the Constitution, right? Here, see, and, and this, it really perturbs me a lot of times. You know, I've, I've had people intimate, well, it's not relevant anymore. It's antiquated. It's outdated. It's like, Really? This is the bulwark. This is the foundation of our entire, uh, of the United States model. Uh, this as is what we, guarantees your freedom. As we know it. Exactly. That too. Just a minor thing you mentioned. That too. Right? I mean, a specific, that document specifically says, if it is not specifically listed in there, then the federal government has zero power. None. Zero Here's the reality, and I know we die tried from the book of Revelation, but to me it all, it all relates, okay? Because at the time, the founding fathers, I believe a third of them were pastors. I, I, something to that effect. You can research that, corroborate that. Maybe your viewers can. But the bulk of these guys... I'm sure those people actually studied back then. 100%. And I mean, the bulk of these... And let me tell you, the bulk of these guys... Uh, if not all of them, if they weren't pastors, I believe a third of them were pastors. If they weren't pastors, I guarantee 95% of them, if not more, uh, probably were pretty familiar with the scriptures, all kidding aside. And they knew their scriptures well. So when you read this thing, okay, there's no doubt 
that they were inspired by God's word and the Holy Spirit, right? It's just, just, just no doubt. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Thank you.